Hey everyone, welcome again. So um, we are introducing Nicole Meldahl, the Executive Director of the Western Neighborhood Project. And for those of you who joined us uh, several weeks ago for, the, uh, for her presentation on Women on the West Side, so she's back again and this time to talk about Golden Gate Park. And before she starts, uh, before I hand it off to her, I'd love to have her talk, uh, before she jumps in, love to have her have her talk about a couple of things that's happening. Uh, a little bit about Western Neighborhood Project, of course. Um, something called History Day, and uh, there's a History Happy Hour too. So, Nicole, why don't floor is yours? Fantastic. Uh, I'm just gonna get the share screen going before we before we really get into this, because once we're in, we're in, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, <laughs> sharing, and then play from current slide. Okay. Now we're all set up. Yes, okay. Thank you for the introduction, Kenneth. Um, this is Monumental Golden Gate Park, our presentation on um, some intimate uh, uh, viewpoints of the park, basically just what I really, really like about the park. And before we really get going, um, as you said, I am Nicole Meldahl, Executive Director of Western Neighborhoods Project. Um, we are a, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna have to give you the elevator pitch really fast. Uh, we are a 501c3 California nonprofit that preserves, interprets, and shares the history of San Francisco's overlooked West Side by hosting lectures and film screenings and rotating exhibitions in the Richmond District, normally at our home for history located at 1617 Balboa Street. And we also make articles and videos and uh, a podcast called Outside Land San Francisco that you see here, available online on our website, which is outsidelands.org. So if you go there right now, you'll find listings for two events that are coming up. One is we're in charge of curating San Francisco History Days, which is normally at the Old Mint the first weekend of March every year, but because of the pandemic and all the crazy things that 2020 has thrown at us. <laughs> it's going to be next weekend, September 25th through the 27th, and it's a virtual online event. So go to sfhistorydays.org if you wanna know more. And also uh, we have our History Happy Hour coming up next Thursday, September 24th, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's me chatting with a local artist named Thomas Butel over drinks about how history has informed his work and also um, his life growing up in the Sunset District in the 1960s and 1970s. So there will be embarrassing childhood photos of myself and others, and um, it's a very casual, fun event. I encourage you to go to outsidelands.org slash events to learn more and sign up. So we also, in support of this work, launched an auxiliary program in 2014 called Open SF History that rehouses and digitizes thousands of historical San Francisco images from roughly about the 1850s through the 1990s on our sister site, opensfhistory.org. And uh, we have what we think is probably the oldest photo ever taken of Alcatraz Island there, by the way. Um, but Almost all the photographs that I'll be showing you tonight uh, came from Open SF History, except for I think maybe one or two of the Conservatory of Flowers. So we have a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> it's really hard to fit 150 years of history into an hour. So I decided to briefly focus on the park's origins and then delve into its first major building the Conservatory of Flowers and use that as kind of a pivot point to discuss two of my favorite people connected to the park. The first is longtime superintendent John McLaren, who some of you may have heard of, and the second is a woman named Sydney Stein Rich, who was the first female gardener in Golden Gate Park, who I'm guessing you have not heard of. And then I will talk about one of the first major events that built out a large part of the park as we know it today. So let's get going. Let's keep moving along. Oh, and by the way, Ken's um, helping me out by answering any questions since I can't see that while I'm giving the lecture. So if you have anything you wanna ask me, go ahead and ask him and we'll address it at the end of the program. Okay, let's go all the way back to the beginning. <laughs> 
Originally, uh, the city asked a man named Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed Central Park in New York City, for recommendations on building out a similar park here in San Francisco. He told city officials that the area that we know of today as Golden Gate Park, which at the time was called the Great Sand Bank on local maps, he told the city that that was unsuitable for a park and he proposed a green belt that stretched roughly from present day Aquatic Park to DeBose Park. But after the Outside Lands Act of 1866 formally brought the Western neighborhoods into the boundaries of San Francisco, the park was surveyed and laid out by this man here you see on the left. His name is William Hammond Hall and he began surveying the park in 1868. Then when legislation formally designated the park was signed, on April 4th, 1870. Um, that formally brought the park into existence and that's what we consider the park's birthday today. And this on the right is Hall's map from the first biennial report of the San Francisco Park Commissioners, which was published in 1871. And you'll see in the upper right hand corner, there's an area marked C and that identified a site for a potential conservatory, which was always part of the plan for Golden Gate Park, even if they didn't know how it would manifest at the time. And it's also the reason why people think, well, it's also the reason why there's a lot of confusion over the conservatory's origins, because at the time it was known as Plateau Mound, and we'll get into some more of that confusing history in a second. So while the city was planning a park, in a location against Olmsted's advice. <laughs> Hall did fo follow some of Olmsted's recommendations, particularly his idea of incorporating and highlighting natural landscape features that made the area so special and unique. But the sand did mm -hmm. prove hard to cultivate. Hall originally tried planting lupine, which is a perennial shrub, but their roots wouldn't take hold fast enough to combat the intense winds in the sandy part of the city. But then Hall noticed that barley grain, which was spilling from a horse's feed bag, sprouted. And so he did some experimenting. He added sea bent grass and yellow lupine, and he mixed this in with manure from the same horses that were plowing the fields. And this was the magic combination. By 1873, the shifting sand dunes were harnessed and the Golden Gate Park that we know and love today had started to take shape. And while William Hammond Hall was busy surveying and laying out Golden Gate Park, a man named James Lick was very busy becoming an extremely rich capitalist in San Francisco. He suffered a stroke and started to put his affairs in order in 1874, creating a trust and designating a comprehensive list of organizations and also monuments that he wanted to fund and build after his death. So this included things you've probably heard of today, like the Lick Observatory, but also places that maybe you haven't heard of because they're not around anymore, like the Lick Baths or my personal favorite, the Lick Old Ladies Home. Yes, that is what it was called, and that was there in the center. It was a retirement home for older women who didn't have any family. <laughs> and also the Francis Scott Key Monument, which they thought would go on that original site, Plateau Mound, where they had sort of sketched out a conservatory. So they renamed the area Mount Lick, and this is what caused so much confusion about the origins of the conservatory of flowers. But first, um, well, I would be remiss if we didn't spend a moment on the Francis Scott Key Monument, which was tagged and toppled by protesters on Juneteenth of this year, along with nearby statues um, uh, commemorating Ulysses S. Grant, which you see there in the center, and also Father Junipero Serra on the far right. We've been at Western Neighborhoods Project. We've been researching various statues um, as part of a deferred exhibition thank you COVID-19, titled Monumental Golden Gate Park, which we had planned to install working with the Rec and Park Department in March. And we had no idea how um, relevant it would become as the year progressed. And what we found in our research into these different monuments throughout the park is that there, first of all, is no comprehensive city plan that incorporates statues in the park. All of them have been commissioned and 
funded privately, which means that the motivations behind these public works of art are almost as varied as the forms that they take. Those motivations are now being re-examined and we're finding that history is far more nuanced than we can ever communicate in stone. Uh, for example, James Lick had a history with Baltimore. So the siege of Fort McHenry, which inspired the Star Spangled Banner was particularly dear to him. But Key himself was a vocal anti-abolitionist who advocated for the preservation of slavery. And if we look at the Junipero Serra statue, this piece was financed by a former San Francisco mayor named James Phelan, who would later run for California on the platform of Keep America White in 1920. So whatever your thoughts are about Sarah and the mission system he implemented throughout California, one thing we do know for sure is that Phelan's motivation for installing this particular monument in Golden Gate Park was to promote his vision of San Francisco as a white and Christian city. And we have a whole podcast on it that um, we sort of got into the complexities of this conversation. But I will say for our time here today that while we as historians don't promote revisionist history, it's worth keeping in mind that the origins of some of these controversial statues are, are worth re-examining to see how they align with our 21st century values as public art. And while the dialogue around this whole thing can get, well, it can get very intense, um, I think that we should remember that these statues essentially are about physically claiming space in public view. That's why so many of them were commissioned and fundraised by immigrant groups or veteran groups, people who are trying to make themselves visible in, a, in their new country or in the country they helped to preserve. And if public art is about claiming space, then I think that the desire to remove them really isn't that different from the desire to install them. And I hope that this means that the two sides of this difficult conversation, whether to keep them here or to remove them, I'm hoping this means that we aren't really very far apart and that we can come to some sort of an agreement on what should be in the public eye going forward. So a complex conversation, obviously, that I just zoomed over. But um, again, hold your questions for later if you have them, because we do need to keep moving forward. So when James Lick died in 1876, his trust went into a protracted legal battle. And once this all wrapped up and specific allotments were made, everything left over was split between two of his favorite organizations, the California Academy of Sciences and the Society of California Pioneers. So two pioneers went to conservatories in pieces and in crates from the trust that were then purchased by a group of 27 very influential San Francisco men with very familiar sounding names like um, uh, Leland Stanford and Klaus Spreckles and Charles Crocker, that kind of level San Franciscan. And they're known to history as the 27 who donated the conservatory to the Golden Gate Park commissioners in 1878. And we helped, we helped the Conservatory of Flowers celebrate its 140th anniversary a couple years ago, really delving into um, its backstory. This is one of the photos that they used a lot during that celebration. It's one of the earliest photos of the conservatory from about 1879. And behind you, you can see what, um, what occupied a lot of the west side at the time, which was a cemetery called Lone Mountain Cemetery. At the very far right on the top of the hill, that's the Broderick Monument that can be seen in a lot of West Side photos around the same time period. But what we learned or what we found when we started digging into the history of the conservatory is that there's probably more unknowns than there are knowns because the, the paper trail just wasn't there and there's been a lot of rumors that got put down on paper and was taken as fact. So there, one of the biggest points of contention is where did it come from? Did it originate in France? Did it originate in England or New York? And we believe 
it most likely was commissioned from a New York firm called Lord and Burnham. And they were the manufacturer of these kinds of buildings in the United States at the time for both private clients and also public projects. In fact, you can still find their conservatories all over the country, like um, the Botanical Gardens in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Also our National Botanical Garden in Washington, DC is a Lord and Burnham project. Um, and locally, they also worked. They produced a conservatory for the private D.O. Mills estate in Millbrae. Ever wonder where the name Millbrae comes? It's because a man named D.O. Mills owned a large portion of that, uh, that town at one time. And Lord and Burnham also built a conservatory for UC Berkeley around 1894, which is sadly not there. It was torn down in the 1930s to put up a parking lot. So <laughs> we do prove that they had, they did work locally. They worked prolifically in the country, which is definitely in their favor in, um, instead of this hazy origins abroad. And further lending credence to our belief that Lord and Burnham was, um, was the origin for this conservatory is that they were also hired to oversee the construction of building of it. And F.A. Lord personally came out here to supervise the project and our conservatory, which you see here right before it opened, we think, in April 1879. It was the first public building in Golden Gate Park. But while we do know the exact date that the park was founded, we don't know the exact date that the conservatory opened. And let me tell you, when we were deep diving into this history, <laughs> my colleague, Chelsea Sellen and I were like, we're gonna find this date. I can't believe no one's found this date. How is this possible? I went deep into John McLaren's personal archives and the History Center at the Public Library thinking, oh, well, in his journals, I bet he went and made some note that said, oh, I attended this lovely affair at the Conservatory of Flowers today. Couldn't find it. It's still a mystery. Um, <laughs> and we don't know why something this monumental the first huge public conservatory in San Francisco didn't have a formal opening date. We have a couple theories, um, one of which is that maybe the opening was delayed when a steamer called the Georgia, which was carrying a, an essential heating apparatus and some other materials destined for the conservatory, sank off the coast of Central America in September 1879. Um, or another theory is that it was postponed due to a protracted economic depression that the country was just coming out of at the time, following the panic of 1873, which would have accounted for like a lack of funds and some staff shortages. We don't know, maybe a combo, um, but uh, we do know that the conservatory, when they did open their doors for the first time, it was instantly popular with people. I mean like smash box office hit. And one of the things they had on display were ornamental flowers like azaleas in the West Wing, which you can see over here on the left. And we were digging through newspaper reports from 1879. And there were several hilarious articles about women stealing plants from the ornamental wing to outfit their own parlors and whatnot. Um, also, a specialized thermometer was stolen. So, Two of the conservatory attendants were made special police officers and they were given the authority to, and I quote, arrest any person without regard to sex who is discovered making depredations in the conservatory. <laughs> so a little bit of a entertaining archival research there. Um, so again, immensely popular. The first blockbuster exhibition at the conservatory was the blooming Victoria Regia. Named for Queen Victoria, it bloomed indoors for the first time at Kew Gardens in England uh, about a decade prior, I think. Um, and this is one of the conservatories that it, it's rumored our conservatory was patterned after. So here you can see a really early photo inside the conservatory, um, as well as a rendering in the left-hand corner of, of the Victoria Regia that are from the archives at Kew Gardens. And the British consul actually gifted a seed from this pioneer indoor uh, Victoria Regia at the Kew Conservatory. They donated to us um, the first year the conservatory opened. It was the 
only known specimen of its kind in the United States. And the pond that you see here, which is still there today, was specifically constructed for it. This has been a crowd favorite for over 140 years, although maybe less of a crowd favorite to the corpse blossom now, uh, which seems to have eclipsed it in, uh, <laughs> in popularity, but still a tradition that would have been impossible without European advancements in conservatory technology that were copied by Lord and Burnham. And I really went deep into the different technologies of conservatories, which I'm not going to bore you with today, but um, just know that I have researched this intensely. <laughs> Now, you might notice that the conservatory looks a wee bit different than it used to, although mostly the same. Um, you'll see here the first dome on the left. So there was a fire in 1883 that was caused by the furnace, which destroyed the original central dome and many exotic plants. But don't worry, there was no loss of life. Um, well, okay, except one parrot. There was one parrot that didn't make it out, but no human loss of life. Um, and again, Charles Crocker steps up, he donates $10,000 to rebuild, and the new dome, which you can see on the right, was a little bit taller, and they replaced the original eagle finial on the top with a finial that represents the planet Saturn. So now you know, if you've never known that the planet Saturn sits atop the Conservatory of Flowers. Um, but they weren't out of the woods yet. <laughs> I guess that's a park pun. Um, there was another fire <laughs> in 1918 that caused a partial collapse of the glass roof and damage to the potting room. But again, they rebuilt, everything was going along pretty well. Then we get to the Great Depression in the 1930s, which actually threatened it with closure because of staff cuts and deferred maintenance that continued on into the 1940s with World War II again diverting resources away from the park and the conservatory. So this, which is an amazing Kodachrome slide from our collection, is around 1945. You can see that some of the, the metal bits on, on the dome are rusting. The signature white paint that keeps the interior conditions regulated, it hasn't been replaced in quite some time. The flower beds out front are also empty. Um, so they kind of limped along. There were, it's not a lot of information around like the 30s, 40s, and 50s at the conservatory. Um, we think that there's periodic shutdowns. It wasn't always open to the public. It, um, but the worst part of the conservatory's history actually came in 1995 when there was a massive windstorm. Maybe some of you in, in the audience today remembers this. There were gusts of 100 miles per hour in December of that year. They, it shattered 40% of the glass, it destroyed plants, and the building closed. And a lot of us were very unsure if it would ever reopen again. But San Francisco came to its aid. Local fundraising got national attention when it was placed on the World Monuments Fund's list of 100 most endangered sites. And then in 1998, First Lady Hillary Clinton visited the conservatory inducting it into the Save America's Treasures program. And the attention from all of this combined is what brought in the $25 million needed for restoration, which began in 2000. And of course it reopened to 2000 in, in 2003 and is one of my personal favorites when it, you know, in the before and after times, pandemic times um, to visit in the park. So now I've used this conservatory as a pivot point, like I said before, to discuss two of my favorite people. And the first is John McLaren. So here you see a sundial of pattern, pattern flowers that he designed for Conservatory Valley's flower bed in 1891. And I just think this is a wonderful example of his attention to detail and the thought and cultivation that went into all of his work in Golden Gate Park. So on the triangular arbor that you see there, he uh, planted morning glory vines that are crawling up the arbor. Get it? Morning glory, time, yada, yada. And um, on the, cir the circular border that went around it, he planted thyme. So it was fragrant and evoked thyme. Um, although <laughs> with all of his care and attention to detail, uh, it wasn't very accurate. It didn't tell time very well. <laughs> 
Uh, and the San Francisco call called him out on that. Oh, I'm just like full of puns today. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but this was here until 1939 when the valley was redesigned and its current configuration was put into place. So we've had what looks like the Conservatory of Val the Valley right now since 1939. And um, John McLaren was completely beloved for thoughtful touches like these. Um, so beloved so much that they treated him like a mascot and rolled him out for every kind of event known to mankind with the um, parks department. He was born in Scotland and he worked on a private estate in San Mateo uh, before he was hired as the successor to the park's original surveyor and first superintendent, William Hammond Hall. So he was with the park, McLaren was with the park from 1889 until his death in 1943. And he was, he was very, very devoted to the cultivation of species in the park. I heard, I heard a figure, I don't know if it's true, but I heard that he planted over 600 varietals during his tenure. And I know uh, personally from going through his journals that um, it seems like little else mattered besides the cultivation of different species to this man. Cause every single journal entry of his was like, September 16th, rained. Perfect time to cultivate, insert plant species here. Not personally exciting to me, but um, I'm sure very, very helpful to so many botanists in San Francisco now. Um, <laughs> but I could also hear, we've heard rumors uh, over the years working in West Side history that he was pretty grumpy at times. And I really can't blame him, like I said before, they rolled him out at a certain point for every single photo out possible. This is one of my absolute favorite photos from the Open SF History Archive. That's McLaren on the left, hooked up to the back end of a horse um, for the opening of McLaren Park in his honor in 1925. He is surrounded by an incredibly important man. You've got Superintendent McSheeny, uh, or I'm sorry, Board of Supervisor Member McShee, and then in the background, <laughs> that's Mr. and Mrs. Herbert Fleischacker. Herbert Fleischacker, the Fleischacker family is um, a major philanthropic force here in San Francisco. He was on the park commission at the time. His wife can't even look at what's going on. She's like, oh God, they've got McLaren tied up to a plow. I can't take this. Um, <laughs> but beloved, everyone loved him. When he hit the maximum age for a city employee, they actually made an exception so he could continue in his job. And they built him his own private residence with meeting rooms for park commissioners and on the lower floor. And they built this in 1896 at an incredible cost. Um, I've heard figures that say in 1896 dollars, it was around $52,000, which today would have been around 1.5 million. And they hadn't originally planned for it to be a combination residence and meeting area, but there was such public outcry that we spent this much money on a house for a city employee that they, they bifurcated it and made it into a, a dual meeting place. But anyways, now I'm getting off topic. Um, <laughs> they loved him so much that they threw him a huge birthday party every year. Here he is on the front porch of his home, watching festivities on the lawn, like no expenses um, um, considered too much. Uh, I don't think he actually enjoyed these, but he always came out for a little like, you know, little wave and um, a photo op. <laughs> And he also, some of the other interesting things that I like, the little t McLaren tidbits that keep coming about, it's rumored that he hated statues and um, he would often strategically place plantings around the different monuments that were going up in the park so that they would grow and gradually obscure them over time, which I love. It's like, it's like a long con, it's amazing. Um, and, I, and what do you do? How do you memorialize a man who gave so much to the park and absolutely hated statues. Of course, you give him a statue. There is a statue to uh, depicting John McLaren. It's in the rhododendron dell now, which apparently was his favorite flower. And what I love about this statue, it's one of my favorite in the park because it's not on a pedestal. His, the bronze piece is rooted directly in the ground. His, his feet are in the soil. 
And he's also inspecting this pine cone. Um, we didn't have any good photos of it in the OpenSF History Archive, so I'm sorry you can't see it right now, but he's inspecting this pine cone almost like he's kind of confused, but many people make the joke that it looks like he's looking at a, an iPhone now. So talk about a statue that really uh, progressed in meaning <laughs> with the 21st century. Um, and it, this statue was created in um, 1911 by a man named Earl Cummings, who you see here working on another bust of McLaren. Cummings was actually a park commissioner who sculpted numerous other statues in the park, like um, the, the Doughboy at the Grove of Memory and the statue of Robert Burns. Um, you know, pretty good gig being an artist and a park commissioner who can commission your own art. Um, <laughs> but even though the statue we now have of McLaren was created in 1911, he wouldn't allow it in the park. So it was actually installed the year after he died in 1944. So that's the first of my favorite people in the park. The second, and this is my absolute favorite person connected to the park um, and the Conservatory of Flowers, is a woman named Sydney Steinrich. And she was the daughter of Russian immigrants. She came from a broken home and was largely on her own for most of her life, pretty rare for this time period. Um, she lived early on at the Emanuel Residence Club at 300 Page Street, which is now the San Francisco Zen Center, um, designed by Julia Morgan. And she graduated from the California School of Gardening for Women in Hayward, which was one of the earliest horticultural colleges for women in the United States. And she left there and became the first woman to be hired as a gardener by the city of San Francisco. Um, she was, well, she was the only woman on a crew of 100 gardeners in charge of the floral designs, the floor plaques, like right outside of the conservatory by 1934. And um, she led a long career there, even though John McLaren refused to hire her twice, she kept coming back. <laughs> um, she had a long career there. And I think it was somewhere around 1949 that she retired. Um, and when she died, her sister started a, a fund to uh, just finance general improvements, the interior of the conservatory, but also to give her her own um, monument, if it was, if you, if you will. It was um, one bench, which uh, was immediately in place outside. It has a nice little dedication to her, and. Over time, they lost the bench. <laughs> and it wasn't until the 1995 windstorm at the conservatory when they started clearing the grounds out that they found the bench again and they put it inside the conservatory of flowers where you can still see it today. Um, and ironically, this is the only monument to a real woman in Golden Gate Park. The closest contender, aside from Nancy Pelosi Drive, is the Pioneer Mother statue, which is a fictionalized account of a pioneer woman. So um, Sydney's still making history, <laughs> even in death. And also, I have to say, if you want to hear Sydney's full story, I'm giving a lecture just on her for San Francisco Heritage tomorrow. It might be sold out, but they might be still taking reservations. Um, and I know you, they're going to be streaming it live on their Facebook page. So stay tuned for more. <laughs> um, I'm gonna take a brief second to take a sip. So I'm just throwing all this history at you. It's parking. Okay. Um, aside from the conservatory, one of the first events to have a major impact in the park uh, that's still very visible today at least was the 1894 International Midwinter Exposition. Now you can see it here. This is a, a view from Strawberry Hill from 1894. That's the outline of the fair in front of you. And beyond it, it is the Richmond District. So in 1894, the Richmond District didn't really exist yet. It was just a broad swath of sand dunes that you can see there, which still blows my mind every time I look at this photo. So more often, you'll hear this exposition referred to as the Midwinter Fair. And it was the idea of San Francisco Chronicle owner Michael DeYoung, who had been involved in the World's Fair that just wrapped in Chicago the year before in 1893. And he was a big time San Francisco booster who 
coincidentally owned uh, a large amount of undeveloped land south of the park, which is what's known today as the Sunset District. So he wanted to bring people to California to enjoy the temperate weather and see exhibits that showcased art and technology and resources the state had to offer alongside international exhibitions that put entire cultures on display in accordance with the um, thinly veiled colonial racism of the area, <laughs> uh, of the era. But the most visible remnant of the fair is the music of concourse, the, the music concourse. So the entire footprint of this part of the park was built out specifically for the Midwinter Fair. In fact, if you go there today, um, you can still see some of the original concrete bollards that make up the perimeter of the concourse on the on the elevated levels. If you look closely at this photo, you can see along, you can see the general outline that you're familiar with today, and you can also see those concrete bollards. So a lot of them were replaced when they they redid the um, when they put the underground garage in. But there's the ones that are in a little more shape. Those are the original ones, <laughs> and also. There's some more hidden history at the music concourse. Uh, if you've ever gone to see a relaxing jazz show in the afternoon at the, the Spreckles music stand and you sat in one of those green benches, well, those are holdovers from the Midwinter Fair. Not the wood, the wood has most likely been replaced since 1894. But if you look on the side of the steel, the steel framework for it, it'll say, 1894 Midwinter Fair stamped right in there. So if you have kids, let me tell you, go to the music concourse and say, I'll give you insert prize here if you can find an 1894 Midwinter Fair uh, <laughs> bench still around because they're mixed in, not all of them say it. Um, I do that all the time when I do a kid's tour of the music concourse and it's a winner every time. So another legacy of the Midwinter Fair is the de Young Museum, which you see in the upper right hand corner. Um, none of the massive exhibition halls and concession stands that made up the fair were meant to be permanent, except for the Fine Arts Building, which is pretty common for World's Fairs actually. Um, the Palace of Fine Arts, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, that's a holdover from a fair that was held here in 1915. And it was constructed, the original de Young Museum was constructed in this Egyptian style, which was the overall aesthetic theme of the Midwinter Fair. And after the fair ended, it became known as the Golden Gate Park Memorial Museum. And, uh, oh yeah, that's right. If you've ever wondered why there are two sphinxes standing outside um, um, a very contemporary building, it's because it's, they originated with this Egyptian version of the de Young Museum. So it becomes the Golden Gate Park Memorial Museum. Most of the origins for the collection come from things that were on display at the fair. So art and other artifacts like gemstones, um, those were the first things uh, that became part of the collection. And then Michael de Young used profits from the fair to travel far and wide and collect other art and antiquities to add to the collection. His goal was to make this one of the most preeminent collections in the country. And he bought things in New York from like the Napoleon estate. He's bidding against the, um, you know, other major collectors in New York to get these things for San Francisco. Also a much larger story, but uh, <laughs> feel free to ask me questions afterwards. Um, but aside from the music concourse, or besides from the de Young Museum, I think my favorite feature left over from the fair is our Japanese tea garden. And I want to end this lecture with one of our history moments. Uh, it's a video produced by a local filmmaker named Joey Yee that introduces you to the Hagiwara family who ran the garden for many years and takes you on a tour with gardener captain Stephen Pitsenbarger. So bear with me. <laughs> I'm gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna go through this together. I'm gonna stop share. And now I'm gonna escape out of this. Please work for me. <laughs> and now I'm going to go here and I'm gonna play. 
And I'm gonna hit pause. And I'm gonna share screen again. I always get nervous when I sing through these things. Sorry, everybody. It's more entertaining if I try to perform these technical difficulties. Okay, we're gonna say go. Gonna say go. I'm super excited to announce that we're getting insider access from Gardner Captain Steven Pitzenberger. So buckle up because we're going inside for this episode of Western Neighborhoods Project History Moment brought to you by Joey E. So the garden dates back to the 1894 Midwinter Fair and it was built as the Japanese village concession by a man named George Turner Marsh. He was Australian, an importer and exporter of Japanese art and antiquities, and he's the founder of the Richmond District. His house is one of the biggest in the neighborhoods, and he named it for a town in his country, Australia, Richmond. At the end of the fair, a successful entrepreneur, restaurateur, businessman, and landscape designer named Makoto Hagiwara was installed as manager of the Japanese tea garden. He built a home here for himself and his extended family in 1910, and he slowly expanded the acreage of the grounds, importing art and statuary and birds and fish into the gardens. Let's bring Stephen back to show you some of the original features from the Midwinter Fair and some other parts of the tea garden that connect with the Hagiwara era. So where I'm standing right here is kind of at the center of what the original garden was. The original garden was about an acre in size. And this site was actually selected because of the topography and because of the beautiful pines that you see above our head. These pines predate the garden. They were here planted probably in the 1870s and now have the twisted shapes because they've been pruned for more than 100 years. There isn't much in the way of physical objects that you would be able to see today that existed from 1894. What remains is the feeling. There is an air about the garden that has remained despite the physical changes that happened over time. So this is the current location of the drum bridge. The carpenters, the gardeners, the craftsmen that physically build spaces like this their names usually get lost uh, over the folds of time, but we know the name uh, Nakatani because uh, a descendant of Shinshichi uh, Nakatani, a uh, cat's Nakatani, who now lives in Southern California, has come up and attended our park commission meetings regularly to make sure that his ancestor has been honored. The story of the Hagiwara family here at the Tea Garden is also one of systemic racism in California. Following the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, Japanese American families on the West Coast were relocated to parts of interior North America. The Hagiwara family were forcibly removed to Tanferan Assembly Center. That's where the Tanferan Mall is today to give you some points of reference. They wouldn't return to San Francisco until after October 1945. So after the Hagiwaras were removed, the word Japanese was completely removed from the tea garden's name. It was referred to as just simply tea garden, sometimes oriental tea garden. The Hagiwaras home that they had built and lived in for so many years was immediately demolished on this site and replaced by this sunken garden designed by Julius Gerard. When the family returned to San Francisco in the 1950s, they actually sold many of their possessions at auction and they used the proceeds for that, at least part of it, to buy a home in the Richmond district where the family still lives today. After a peace treaty was signed with Japan here in San Francisco in 1951, and it was implemented in 1952, park commissioners restored the Japanese tea garden name and various landscape features were installed around the tea garden, signifying our new unity with Japan. Now I'm gonna pass the mic to Steven Pitzenbarger, who's going to tell you more about these interesting landscape features. This is the Karisansui, which literally means a dry landscape garden, designed by Nagao Sakurai in 1953. And this part of the garden was my favorite part of the garden long before I had any idea I would end up working here. Uh, I grew up in San Francisco and would visit the Japanese tea garden like so many children in San Francisco. And I admired 
the peaceful feeling here in this part of the garden. Now, as an adult and someone who studied uh, Japanese gardens, I appreciate the strong design. So if you're looking at it here, the tall stones on the left feel like a waterfall going into this body of water uh, that then flows off into the stream off to the right. And the two islands in the middle represent turtles. Turtles and cranes are motifs that are oft repeated in Japanese gardens and especially in relation to water. So if you see a pond, the shape of a turtle or the shape of a crane is a very common uh, shape that you'll see. So I'm standing in front of the Lantern of Peace. This came into the garden after the signing of the peace treaty in 1951 between Japan and the Allied Nations. The children of Japan saved up money and purchased this lantern and donated it to the United States as an everlasting symbol of peace. It, of course, came to San Francisco because this is where the treaty was signed. And then San Francisco thought, where are we going to put a Japanese lantern other than the Japanese tea garden? So this part of the garden has, to me, a fascinating story. When the Hagiwaras were informed that they had to go to internment camps in 1942, they tried to make arrangements for as many of their possessions as they could. In that collection was a collection of trees, the potted plants. The collection of plants got sold to a Japanese nursery in the East Bay, uh, Nobu Kawabata. He bought those trees as a collection and then sold them as a collection to Dr. Hugh Fraser and his wife, Audrey Fraser. When she passed away in 1963, She'd written in her will that she wanted the trees to come back to the garden. And so the hillside behind me, complete with the waterfall, the boulders, many of the small trees, that is part of that collection. That went from the Hagiwaras to the Frasers and then back to the garden. In 1974, a plaque designed by local sculptor Ruth Asala was installed in the garden and also installed at the same time were little froggies designed by Asawa. You can see one here, here, over there, and then my favorite one peeking out right here. Okay, the building that I'm standing in front of now is what we refer to as the Temple Gate. The Temple Gate is under renovation. You can see all the blue tape and the primer on it. It's in the process of getting painted. We are restoring the Temple Gate and we are restoring the Pagoda. The Pagoda and the Temple Gate, which stand pretty close to each other now, also stood next to each other at the PPIE. They were both inside the Palace of Food Products in a display that uh, was displaying sake, beer, ginger, and peanuts. The original version of the Temple Gate was falling apart uh, in the 70s and 80s. It was torn down and replaced in 1985, but now it's getting painted again. So hopefully the structure will stand for many generations to come. So this is the, the structure, the scaffold and the shrink wrap around the pagoda. The shingles will be replaced, it'll be stabilized, and then it'll get painted and it'll look brand new again. And we are still in the process of uh, raising funds for this entire project. So if you want to be a part of that effort, uh, you can join uh, San Francisco Recreation and Park Department, the Parks Alliance, and the Friends of the Japanese Tea Garden by going to saveourpagoda.com. This is our Buddha here. Uh, this was cast in 1790 in Japan. It ended up in San Francisco as part of the Gump's department store. And then Gump's donated it to uh, Rec and Park. And in 1949, it made its way into the Japanese Tea Garden. Some of my favorite pictures of this statue, there's a a woman uh, with hair about this high. Then I've got another picture of the band, the doors, all sitting on the Buddha. Uh, if you're part of the public, don't sit on Buddha. No, it's not good. <laughs> well, this feels like the right place to stop. We're right next to the George Turner Marsh plaque as well. So a fitting end to our story today. Stephen Pitsenbarger, thank you so much for joining us. It's been great having you here, Nicole. I enjoyed it too. So the next time you're in Golden Gate Park, if it's a Wednesday, through a Sunday, 9 a.m. to 5.45 p.m., make sure to stop in and track down Stephen Pitsenbarger. I'm Nicole Meldahl. This has been another Western Neighborhoods Project History Moment brought to you by Joey Yee. We'll see you on the next one. Okay. I just feel like that breaks up the monotony a little bit. I just don't want to talk at you for, you know, however long, but, um, but yeah, I, uh, that's my presentation. I'm, 
I, I'm going to throw up one more slide just to make sure that you have contact information for me. Plus, this is just one last photo that is my absolute favorite from the Open SF History Archive. It's a woman at the Cliff House in the 1950s chowing down not one, but two corn dogs. And she is like, if you ever look at old photos and you think, man, I could be friends with that person, this is my lady. So um, that's Nicole at OutsideLambs.org if you want to get a hold of me. And hopefully some of you may have some questions. I know. Yeah, they do. You know, uh, Carla has a great one. She was asking, how was the um, Golden Gate Park conceived when it was built? And was it as beloved back then as it is today? Um, yeah, it was instantly popular. Although I will say that at the very beginning in the 1870s, 1880s. This was still way out here. The west side was not developed. The Richmond, the Sunset districts that we know today didn't really start to develop in force until the turn of the century around the 19-teens, 1920s is when it really gets going. So um, yeah, I guess similar to today, you know, for, for families uh, with limited uh, transit abilities, it's hard to get out all, all the way to the west side. So yes, definitely very popular. Um, a lot of the major attractions that were built into the park early on um, were catered towards richer demographics. So there was a speedway that was put in so that um, gentlemen who wanted to race each other in their carriages would do so on one lane in particular and not endanger the rest of us normal folks around the park. And then of course the polo grounds were put in in 1909 as well, catering to a richer clientele. So it took a while for it to become everybody's park, which is how the um, Rec and Park Department like to refer to it today. Um, did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, um, someone else was also really curious about the, uh, the model boat club out in Spreco's Lakes. Like well, what's, what's it? Like every time I go out there on the weekends, I see them racing around. What's the story behind that? Yeah, so we actually have a podcast on it, not to plug our podcast, but there is a podcast on the Model Yacht Club. We had the Commodore of the club come and speak with us, so someone far more knowledgeable about the park's origins. But if I remember correctly, um, it, Spreckles was a member of the Park Commission who was very into model yachting. And so Spreckles Lake there was constructed specifically for model yachts, which is why it's all incredibly level and at a certain part of the park where there wouldn't be too much wind interference. And the original um, clubhouse for the park, for, for the club was built out of um, detritus that they collected after the 1906 earthquake and fire until it was eventually replaced by, um, during a um, works prog uh, projects administration construction project in the 1930s. And um, I don't know about right now because things being open is sort of hit or miss, but they do have, I think once a month, one Sunday a month where the clubhouse is open. A lot of the members will take their model yachts out onto the, the Spreckles Lake and it's incredibly enjoyable. They're so nice. These guys just, and, and gals, just want to chat with you about their model yachts. So keep an eye on their website because um, they'll let you know when they're open and you can go visit them. Hey, Nicole, is this the Al Alma, is this the Spreckle of like Alma's husband or is this Alma herself? No, this is, um, this is her husband. Alma was art. Okay. <laughs> Alma loved art and antiquities. He, she particularly loved Auguste Rodin. Um, and uh, Adolf was, uh, was, he was a park commissioner. So he was more focused on um, city infrastructural projects and the advancement of the parks and and his own personal hobbies, which was model yachting. <laughs> Am I remembering right? Like uh, Alma Spreckel, the, the, the statue on top of Union Square would be her. Like, the, like the, that is the wife of the man who founded the model club, model boat club in, in around the lake, right? Is that, did I, did I get the lineage right? That's correct. Yeah, Alma. There's a wonderful book called Big Alma. I highly recommend. It's a quick read. It doesn't feel like you're reading a history book. Um, it's uh, she actually had very humble origins um, on the west side, I believe, in a very rural, sandy part of the Sunset District. Although, don't quote me on that. And she started off as an artist's model. So this was 
not reputable at the time. It's very risque. She would do nude modeling, but she was uh, highly in demand, one of the most sought of models in San Francisco, which is how she caught the eye of a, um, a beet sugar magnet. So truly a sugar daddy. Um, <laughs> and uh, she, he, she married Adolf Spreckles, who just adored her and, and of course gave her the means to be able to finance art a, in a far different way than she could have and her more humble origins. Wow. Hey, we, we also have a quick questions on the um, bison. I was asking people what they like about the park. The bison was a popular one. Well, what's, what's, why do we have a herd of <laughs> bison out there? Like, what's, what's the story? Well, funny you should ask. We also have a video on that <laughs> by Joey Yee. If you go to our website, outsidelands.org or our YouTube video. But the short story is that um, at the end of the 19th century, 1880s, uh, bison were endangered. They were, they were being hunted to extinction for sport and, and for food. And so conservation movements around the United States popped up at the time with municipalities um, uh, trying to, to uh, salvage part of the herd and um, you know, try to uh, regrow them uh, in a domesticated environment. So San Francisco got on the bandwagon. Um, we purchased, there were weird facts that they learn in history. There were like two men who bought all of the remaining um, wild buffalo and domesticated them and started to interbreed them. And so San Francisco bought some foundational uh, bison and then started their own herd here. But most of the descendants of that part of the herd have clearly passed away. The herd that we have now are descendant from a gift to Mayor Diane Feinstein from her husband of a couple bison to sort of refresh the bloodlines. So um, our bison who all have bee names like Bianca and um, I want to say Butters, but I think that's wrong. I think I just want one of them to be named Butters. Um, <laughs> um, they're, all, they're all thanks to the Feinstein family because of this generous gift to the city. Wow. Hey, Nicole, we, our time is up. It's about seven o'clock right now. So Thank you so very much. And if you don't mind, remind us again of the, uh, the history days and the uh, history happy hour. Now, and uh, one more thing about the uh, Western Neighborhood Project and I'll put all those links in the chat box for, for folks who want to learn more. Yeah, so Western Neighborhoods Project, we do an incredible amount of work for a teeny tiny organization. I'm actually the only employee and we survive on individual donations from people like you. So we are a membership based organization. You can go to our website and become a member which helps sustain all the work we do supporting the Conservatory of Flowers and Reckon Park, even the Unified School District. Miss Nicole gives lectures for third graders these days virtually while they're all sheltered in place. So. Um, and we are in charge of History Days this year, which is going to be this awesome showcase of community history on uh, next weekend. And we also That's do the So History Days is the same event that used to be in the Mint, right? It is. Yeah. Have you ever got, um, unfortunately, we can't all gather together in the Mint, but we can still gather together around the joy of local history, albeit through Zoom, which has, you know, made all of our lives possible this year, it feels like. So... Um, keep an eye on the website. We're going to be updating it really soon with the full list of programs and exhibitor pages. Um, we've been thinking on our feet and I promise you it'll be a fun weekend where you get to interact with local historians, see content you never would have access to, and see an, an, an amazing list of programs, including in-person tours that you can sign up for, walking tours throughout San Francisco. So. Wow. Sounds yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> the History Day website, it's going to be live soon or is this live already? No, it's gonna be live soon. We had uh, over 50 exhibitors sign up last minute. So I am feverishly developing the website and getting it overhauled and it'll be up within 48 hours. Well, in case you go on right now, you don't see anything. Don't yeah. <laughs> care if Nicole is working her magic. But uh, hey, everyone, thank you so very much. Uh, check out Outside Lands with the S.org. I'm, I'm a member of the Western Neighborhood Project and um, uh, Send me an email if you have questions. I'm putting my email right there. First, kenneth.wun at gmail.com. Happy to find other ways to, to, to present history. And if you have any topics, uh, let me know. We can go from there. But Nicole, thank you so much. I know you're thank busy. you, for, thank you right. for having me, Colleen, the battery, all of you fine folks today. I really appreciate you spending the evening with me. <laughs> all right. Bye, everyone. Have a great night.